I'm the kind of writer who, even if I want to write like someone else, I can't. I write very much like myself. <laughs> There's something incontrovertible about what, how, whatever way my creative engine works. So I, I can't fake it and I can't imitate all that well. it under my fingers. I had an electric typewriter. The second typewriter I had was electronic. Uh, yeah, people ask you, how did you become a writer or whatever, and you, you just get a story and you stick with it. <laughs> it just makes it easier. So my story is that uh, I didn't, I never intended to become a writer. It was a decision that was somehow made for me. It was an arranged marriage and that my family bought me a typewriter for my 21st birthday. But it is also true. I mean, when my brother, who became an engineer, was 21, we bought him a Texas Instruments calculator. And for my sister, who's a doctor, she got her stethoscope and her ear thing. And I got a typewriter. I mean, this is a bit of a hint. It's a bit of a hint, isn't it? But I was working in the theater. I was, or messing in the theater. I was playing in the theater. I was in Trinity College, and we were in Trinity Players. And we spent all our time in the theater putting on shows. And uh, so I sat down to write for the theater. And it was an immensely clicky thing. Um, and it was great because I used to write journalists and bad poetry and all that adolescent stuff, but it was too, handwriting is too pleased with itself for me it's too personal it just goes on and on and on and then there's another comma and on you go whereas typing i discovered that idea of of the rhythm of things and it was also quite external it didn't look finished but it looked out there as opposed to in here i started out writing short stories um in part because I was working in television full time and I only had the weekends to write and my brain was just about big enough to keep a short story in it. Uh, so I would go home and, and write Friday night to Monday morning and I, and, and I could carry the short story to the next weekend then. Um, but also because I, I love its metaphorical possibilities. Those early short stories I wrote in a book called The Portable of the Virgin, they're literally just they literally just achieve themselves as metaphors. They just, and then they, that's what it is. I, I became more realist, more of a realist later in my, in my short stories. But there are various theories about the short story and why it does so well in Ireland. It possibly is partly because the Irish short story did so well in America. You could put your kids through college on the fees from the New Yorker. So people like Mary Lavin, Frank O'Connor, who published in the New Yorker. It also was an imprimatur of, when Ireland is this, it continues to be a small society, but it was even smaller then, and probably even nastier. So if you had something from outside, like the New Yorker, it was like the Pentecostal flame, right? It descended from heaven, basically. So certainly America was very important to the Irish short story, but the Irish readership is never to be underestimated. Um, the Irish critic is always to be underestimated, right? The Irish reader is never to be underestimated. It's the engine of, you know, everything that happens in Irish writing. And, and, and we read those short stories. We thought they were interesting and important. People have theories about importance, importance. The short story doesn't claim importance. It's a modest form. Um, it's also a lovely and beguiling form. I really, what I love about the short story is that it, the story makes itself. Um, you feel with a novel that the writer is making the novel, but the story makes itself. You can't push a short story. It, it exists in the writing of it, but if you try and take it further than it wants to go, it lies down on the pavement and dies, basically. There's two things people often want to know. They want to know where does the book come from and do you know where it's going? Uh, there's no answer to the first question, but 
to the second judge, I always do know what the emotional arc of a story is. I know how, I know by the time I've got the first sentence, and I won't have the first sentence for a while, but by the time I have that first sentence, I will have stated a kind of emotional problem, and I will, or an emotional conflict, and by the end of the book, I will have resolved that, and there will be a new kind of emotion there. So the end of the gathering, there is a shift of emotion, like a change of weather. Very difficult to get to, but it happens. It's like the silence after a fly s stops buzzing against the pane and flies out the window. Something small. That's what I'm interested in. Something true and, and very slight. And in the end of the Forgotten Walls, there's a similar shift and opening of possibilities, unstated possibilities. Both of them, I think, quite optimistic uh, and real. I quite like reality. And my characters live so much in their heads that reality is a bit maybe of a shock at the end of it all. Um, but uh, so I do, I don't do plot. I do story. And the story is of a woman, I mean, for the last two books, uh, the story of a woman who changes. But you know, that's what a story is. It's about a change. I mean, it's that simple. So on that arc, I hang all my baubles. That scene, that scene, you know. I, I, I had enormous fun writing The Forgotten Walls. I, I put the money in. Uh, people don't talk about money. Uh, they talk to themselves about money. They don't talk to other people about money. We, we, we think about money all the time. Why is it never in? I mean, it's in Victorian novels. It's also in things like The Field uh, by John B. Keane, where love and land are connected. So yeah, they're, they're, they're in love and they have a mortgage. That's what people do. And, um, and they get married, partly, be partly because they have a mortgage, because that's how it goes. Anyway, Gina is more interested in amazing non-mortgage love. <laughs> uh, I'd say she, yeah, she's a romantic of, of, a, of a kind. Uh, it, uh, she's not necessarily a, a greedy sort of girl either, but she's quite materialistic. So she's just as shallow and deep as we all are. There's three books there simultaneously, right? There's a story about a woman who is in love, right? Or there is a story about a woman who is hopelessly in love because that's what love is. What else is it? Or there's a story about an adulterous, a liar, wife stealer, homewrecker. So these three books have to exist simultaneously. And it's up to the reader to decide. Some of them decide very strongly that she's a, a baggage, no better than she should be. Uh, what I enjoyed most is the disjunction between what, what Gina is saying and what we know about her. So she says, she has a description of her lover's wife, and she says, this really boring looking woman. I'm always, I mean, I'm really amused by reviewers who say she is having an affair with Sean, who's married to a really boring woman. She says, well, no, <laughs> like, all we know about this woman is what Gina says. And Gina would say that because she's having an affair with her husband. Um, and I'm interested in how we gradually pull away from Gina's consciousness um, to say, as it were, hang on a minute, there's more going on here. And then wait or, or hope that Gina is going to catch up with us by the end of the book, which I think she does, to see what the reality underneath this blissful and wonderful um, sense of denial. Uh, it, that, 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 you know, I don't mind denial. I mean, I, 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 it's quite a moral book for me. I'm slightly unhappy with that. Uh, because I'm not really a moralist, although the novel is a moral form, for sure. Yeah, there is a slightly allegorical impulse behind it as well. You don't want to, to, to be too definitive in these things, but it seemed to me that uh, Boomtime Ireland was in a state of glorious denial, that people were getting what they wanted, finally, and God knows they deserved it. There was a great sense of entitlement. There was a great sense of... Uh, fantasy uh, and belief. You had to believe in the boom. If you didn't believe in the boom, then property prices would crash and it would be your fault, you see. Because, so it was a confidence trick. Because when belief went out of the economic system, 
all that money turned to debt and ashes. Um, so it seemed to me that uh, an adulterous affair was analogous in some ways, though not you know, absolutely, that you're getting what you want. And God knows you deserve it, just for once, you know. And um, so all of that kind of glee and the, the whole yippee of it, and you know it's not going to last, and you know it's not necessarily right. Well, the, the, nobody said the economic boom was wrong. So there was much anxiety. We were losing our spiritual side. Ireland's always worried about what it's losing now. Ireland's always losing something. Um, and we were losing our loveliness. Because, you know, when we were poor, we were lovely. I didn't think poverty and loveliness were connected. I thought you can be rich and lovely too. But people won't like you so much for it. I don't know. If you're growing up as a, an Irish writer, there were very few female antecedents. Uh, this wonderful Edna O'Brien. I mean, I read her when I was 16. I didn't know she was wonderful. It just seemed like, you know, water or air. It seemed self-evident what she was doing in that first trilogy, the, the Country Girls trilogy, which I read as a teenager. You know, there were very few women to look at and say, oh, when I grow up, I'm going to be that. But there was a great opportunity there, too, because there was a sense of things that were on the brink of being sayable, you know? That there was so much that hadn't been said, that that was a kind of opportunity. But also, when people ask about my sense of humor or my, the irony in my books, it's not a literary irony at all. It's literally the way I would hear women talking. Um, the women of my mother's generation had a harder life than, than we had, for sure. And it seemed that people died more often. <laughs> they, they didn't have much money and, you know, whatever. And their sense of humor was, was really dark. It was really dark. It was a way of, of get, keeping going. But it wasn't dark in the egotistical way. You know, these were give, give, give sort of people, you know. And, and, and so they were just, it was just dark in a kind of keep it moving, <laughs> don't give up, you know, sort of way, so. Uh, and that was very specifically female. People respond quite strongly to the physical detail in the books. They're very interested in my uh, interest in the body, but I don't know where they live if they're not in their bodies, you know. How do they get out of bed in the morning? I don't know, but, uh, but also, I like small physical details because they bring the reader right there. Uh, they're very tangible. So if you describe the, the, the jolt in the neck of the tap when the water, when you turn the water on, people know that tap, you know. They know the silence around the tap. So you've got the whole kitchen. A lot of the books in the last decade or so by some of my fellow writers have been set in America and are about the immigrant story. America clearly calls to these writers very strongly. I have a different sense of America to that. I think in my second novel, one of the twins goes to New York. My generation dispersed and came back. We, we commuted, essentially. I mean, in 1985, when I left Trinity, there were no jobs in Ireland. And, and we stayed because we were in the theatre and we, didn't, we you know, might as well be starving here as anywhere else. And there were no jobs, we were making jobs. But people who wanted jobs came to America or went to London. Um, so a lot of my generation went to America, but they also came back. It was a, just much more mobile than it was for the generation preceding them, where you went to America and that was it. You were gone, gone, gone. And this great mourning and melancholy uh, set in. Um, America, was very important to me as an adolescent writer in, 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 in stylistic terms. So it's, it's almost as if I absorbed America's lesson in subjectivity <laughs> without kind of having the same yearning for the landscape and for the country itself. I don't write about Ireland, I write from Ireland. I, I, I remember talking to someone who didn't like Alice Munro, which is a great blasphemy to me because I really love Alice Munro. And as I was teasing his reasons apart, I realized that he read Alice Munro, the Canadian short story writer, as someone who was writing about what it's like to be a woman in Ontario in the 1980s. That's what he thought there was some insight into Canada.
in the whole business of reading Alice Munro. Um, so I think writers have to stake a claim to statelessness because Ireland's extremely greedy and will always claim that you are writing about it in some both social and essential way. Um, this is a gig that I'm not interested in. Um, certainly to forge in the smithy of my soul, the uncreated conscience of my race. Yeah, all right, a bit, right? But <laughs> a bit, as Joy said. But maybe it's useful to come to, from a country that's so self-obsessed. <laughs> I mean, maybe it is some use in that you kick against it as well as much as anything. And of course, you could say that Ireland is just a series of stories we've told ourselves about a patch of land more than many other patches of land. And you're just adding to the stories. But actually, a lot of the time, I'm kicking away those stories. Um, Irish women were reared to be lovely. And that is, of course, nice but it's not necessarily particularly free. <laughs> so I come and go on the whole Irish thing, basically. Having grown up in the place, I come and go on the whole issue of charm. I think it's Iris Murdoch who said that you write a book to correct the mistakes you made in your previous books, <laughs> which makes the first one really hard. Uh, the first novel, because you don't know what mistake you're correcting, I suppose. So I wrote a book called The Wig My Father Wore. Great difficulty. Um, never choose a silly title for a book, uh, because you'll be saying it for the rest of your life. So I, The Wig My Father Wore, which I haven't looked... I mean, I like it, but I haven't read it, or any of them, since. Um, and... I had been working in television, and that was a book about a woman who worked in television. Um, and it, it was written in the garret, basically. I had left this brilliant day job that everybody thought was a great job, and I had to somehow prove myself. The anxiety was huge and very extreme, much more, much more than any recent anxieties I've had about success or failure. It just seemed that every time I touched the keyboard, the whole world depended on it. Um, and... Uh, and that was a long, slow decade, actually. I wrote What Are You Like, uh, which is a book about twins who are separated at birth. And then I had kids with great trepidation. I thought, this is it. Uh, I'm never going to write again. I, I did it like jumping off a cliff. And instead of never writing again, I just suddenly, all that anxiety about the world, the importance of what I was doing, all that grandiosity and, and, and smallness that goes into a, a sentence went into my children. Because <laughs> actually motherhood, motherhood is quite an egotistical, quite a grandiose thing. You know, look at what I made, you know, and, and endlessly petty. So it took both of those things away. I, it took me out of Dublin and into uh, uh, Bray, which is just too far away to, to, to be distracted from. And I was at home with children all day, um, typing as they slept. Babies, babies. And I got loads of work done, loads of work done. And I wrote books in succession. I wrote The Pleasure of Eliza Lynch, which was a very happy time in my life. And I think some of that pleasure is in the book. Um, then The Gathering, uh, a book of essays about motherhood called Making Babies. and then this last, The Forgotten Wolves. I like to have a very direct relationship to the reader. I don't like to come in from on high. And I'm suspicious of writers who do come in from on high. Um, I like to engage the reader. I like them to have fun. I like to play with them. So I think what uh, if a reader is coming to my work for the first time, the surprise is that the surprise for them is that I don't want them to be passive. That I'm not giving them a book the way you give someone a cup of hot milk before bed. 
you know it's that I, I just I just want to get something going with the reader um, and I don't want to I don't have books I don't want to write books that stay still that stay finished I want people to say yeah, what was that what was that oh that was what that was about or you know in the gathering particularly I, I like to juxtapose separate things so they they make a new kind of noise you know so that you get a new kind of effect so the effect isn't just the story this happens and this happens oh how sad oh how nice but you get two elements put together and there the edge is interesting i am extremely suspicious of omni omniscient narrators i don't know how they know all that stuff i don't know how they know everything and if they know everything why are they putting us through this? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I don't like the power relationship all that much. My narrators are highly subjective. They don't know everything. I think we don't. So if you pretend to know everything, that is also coming a little to the reader from on high. But I, meanwhile, I'll, I'll, I'll stick my head out and, and, and say that um, writing is about truth and we don't know everything so you write as much as you can find to be true at the time um, and my narrators are uncertain because that's the way human beings are because it's more true to the way we think and live in the world i think but i'm all you know i'm hugely interested in cause and effect in the novel a writer puts this down and then this happens and then this happens and then this happens so you're the clear implication that a causes b b causes c and i don't know how they know that because in my own life i don't know what caused here i am i'm married with two children right i don't know the causality that leads me to look at that face in the morning i don't know the path or how it could have been otherwise. I, I don't trust causality in that way. Um, I don't, yes, I pro they probably do look at you differently, yeah. Um, I, I, I get fed up talking about it because the world is obsessed about prizes and, and, and the business of writing is sitting at a desk and writing a book. Um, and then many years after, uh, people decide whether they like it or not enough to give you a prize. It's an incredibly passive thing to happen. It's not something you do, it's something that's done to you. So it feels very passive and slightly out of control. And I really quite like getting back to the desk where I can control as it were. You're not controlling your career at the desk, but you're controlling something. You're controlling your work um, and it's back in your hands. I, I'm, I'm, I come and go on the whole. I'm delighted, of course, to have won a prize. It's always nice. It's, but, you know, it's, uh, it's not something I would want to ever get hung up about. You always want to evolve as a writer. The interesting thing is finding out how and what's next. I have become more realist and less surrealist as I've gotten older. Partly maybe because the world, I know more about the world, it's more interesting to me. I think on the level of the sentence I haven't changed, that I want the sentences to do what they always did, which is somehow to surprise or to turn a corner or whatever, um, or to become metaphorical, which is, you, which is magic, right? And not realism, metaphor is not real. So I model myself very modestly on the career of Picasso, Pablo Picasso, who, you know, the cubism thing was very exciting. Everybody thought it was wonderful and it was very important to deconstruct. It was very important to break things up. But actually, nobody's looking at those paintings anymore. Or I look at them, I'm not interested in them as paintings. I'm not I'm interested in them as a statement. What, I, what people love are those lyrical, slightly sentimental paintings of the blue period. But even more than the late work where he takes, it's like the blue period and he goes back to the a neoclassical thing at the end of his life um, and this to me seems somehow exemplary as a, a way to keep changing and to go back to the form as well as to breaking up the form. Kathy was often wrong she found it more interesting she was wrong about the taste of bananas 
She was wrong about the future of the Bob. She was wrong about where her life ended up. She loved corners, surprises, changes of light. Of all the fates that could have been hers, spinster, murderer, savant, saint, she chose to work behind a handbag counter in Dublin and take her holidays in the sun. For 10 years, she lived with the gloves and beside the umbrellas, their colors shy and neatly furled. The handbag counter traveled through navy and brown to a classic black. Yellows, reds and white were to one side and all varieties of plastic were left out on stands for the customer to steal. Kathy couldn't tell you what the handbag counter was like. It was hers. It smelt like a leather dream. It was never quite right, despite the close and intimate spaces of the gloves and the empty generosity of the bags themselves, the discreet mess that was the handbag counter was just beyond her control.